Hello everyone, this is Jonathan Little. We've been working on a lot of new neat features and tools over at floattheturn.com and today I wanted to share with you the Float the Turn Range Analyzer, which is a fantastic program that I've been using a ton, especially when I've been talking about poker and sharing ranges with my students. So you click on the Tools tab and then you go right over here to Range Analyzer. So let's click on this and I'll show you how to use the Range Analyzer. So this program is particularly good for sharing your hands and your thought process with your friends, either on poker forums or through email or on Twitter or anything like that. So let's just talk about a simple preflop scenario where someone raises and you have to decide what you want to do. Um, let's assume your opponent is someone who will either four bet or fold for the most part. They don't do a lot of calling. So against this player, we want to have a three bet for value range. We also want to have a three bet as a bluff range, we want to have a calling range. So which hands do we want to three bet for value? What are the best hands you want to be re-raising? So it's probably going to be something like this. Which hands do you want to call with? Well, it's going to be your good suited hands, your best big cards, all of your pairs, and then maybe a few suited connectors like this. And then which hands do you want to bluff? Well, intuitively, most people decide to bluff with something like this. So just looking at this range, you may think, okay, this is a nice balanced range. Your opponent's going to have a tough time against this. And while that's true, you can look right down here and it'll show you which portion of your range is three betting for value, which portion is three betting as a bluff, and which portion is calling. And if you've studied game theory optimal poker strategies at all, you know that you want to have about two-thirds bluff hands compared to your value hands. So what that means is that we can have about up to 84 eight combinations of three betting as bluffing hands. And notice here we only have 64. So what this means is that we can actually add in some more bluffing hands. So what many amateur players do whenever they first see that they need more bluffing hands, they say, okay, I'm going to add in all the suited ace sexes. But if you take a look at this, this is actually a few too many. Like I said, you want to kind of cap it at about 88 hands. And 88 hands is not the number. It's just two times whatever the three bet for value range is. So we need to deselect a few of these. Notice that just taking away seven six or a six suited does the job, and that is perfectly fine. And this is going to be a range that's going to be really tough to deal with. Um, a lot of people are kind of confused about why you want to have more bluffs in your range than you value bets early in the hand, and that's just because whenever your opponent decides to re-raise you, they four bet. Now you can fold out two thirds of the time and still put in money with just a very very premium range of these hands. Now if you decide you don't want to be three betting. Ace Queen suited for value. Let's take a look at what happens if you decide to call Ace Queen suited and maybe call Pocket Jacks. Now you see there's only 34 combinations of premium hands, right? Of three bet for value hands. So that means we need to bluff less often. So now this needs to be capped at about 72 hands at the most, and maybe just a few less. I always like going just a little bit tighter pre flop than than a two to one ratio, but it, it doesn't really matter versus a generic player. Um, so it's, you can maybe do something like this. Notice that now that all the calling hands are going to flop reasonably well, all the three betting hands either have blockers or have post-flop potential. Notice the big cards over here have blocking value and the ASX suited has blocking value and these hands kind of in the middle are going to flop reasonably well. And uh, your premium hands are obviously great. So this is going to be a really strong range that's too tough to do anything about. So that's how you can use the range for preflop. You could also discuss uh, uh, three betting for lesser value if you wanted to three bet with a linear range, and you can use that to show your opponent or show your friends and what's going on, and you can discuss poker with them. And you know what happens is a lot of people will come to me and they'll say, "How do you play pocket jacks?" And the answer is it depends on your whole range, right? It doesn't necessarily depend on how do you play this specific hand in various spots. What matters is how do you pl how do you play your whole range? So let's talk now about post flop scenarios. Let's assume that we actually raise with this whole range from, I don't know, middle position, which I think is perfectly fine. And let's say the flop comes jack of spades, seven of clubs, four of diamonds, just for example. And now, after the flop, you're going to have four types of hands. You're either going to have a premium made hand, which you're going to want to bet. This is assuming we are the pre-flop raiser now. You're going to have a draw, which you also want to bet. You're going to have a marginal made hand, which you're going to want to check. Then you're going to have junk, which you're also going to want to check. 
And the reason you're doing this is because you don't want to make it obvious to your opponents that every time you check, you have nothing. What a lot of weak players do is every time they check, they just have their junk. So what is junk on jack 7-4? Well, threes and twos usually classify as junk. Ace-8 is junk. Ace-9 is junk. Ace-10 is junk. Um, King-10 is junk. Queen-10 is junk. King-9 is junk. Queen-9 is junk. And that's about it. Um, yeah. Okay. So which hands are marginal? Actually, let's go down and do the premium made hands now. So which hands naturally fall into a premium made hand range? That's going to be your top pairs. It's going to be your sets. Let's actually set all the top pairs and now just for simplicity. Now, what are our marginal made hands? I guess king queen's probably going to fall in junk naturally. Marginal made hands are going to be Ace, king, and ace, queen. Usually you can check call that on this board. Tens, nines, eights, eight, seven, seven, six, nine, seven. And then these hands fall into the draw range. So this is how this range would somewhat normally line up if you were to just intuitively think about it. So think about how you normally play these hands on these, on these boards. Most amateur players bet their top pairs and better, check their marginal made hands, you know, maybe a pair or their best high card hands. Then they give up with a lot of their junk and they bet with some of their draws. And a lot of people think, okay, this is great. We've put all of our hands in these buckets. This all makes sense. We're good to go. But that's not the case because we have virtually no bluffs in this range. We have no draws in our betting range just because there's so few combinations of potential draws. So what we need to do is we need to now look for hands that can conceivably fit in the draw range that make a lot of sense. Hands that have some equity, but um, you know they're not necessarily strong hands. As you see, we, we have no great draws, but it's still good to have draws. And usually on the flop, you can have about a two to one ratio of premium made hands to draws where you can have maybe, well, if we have 69 combinations of premium made hands, we wanna have 140 combinations or 138 combinations of draws, and clearly that's not gonna happen. So let's, um, let's address the draws first. Let's put into our draw range Notice spades, clubs, diamonds. Let's select spades, clubs, and diamonds. Let's put in all of our big card hands that have backdoor equity. So that's going to be all of these. So these hands all have backdoor flush draws and some sort of like gut shot type draw going on. So that bumps us up to 27 hands. Notice now that we've deselected the... Um, heart version of these five hands. So we actually have to put these back in the junk. So that's going to be five additional combinations going to the junk. Notice the draw is about to go from, I'm sorry, the junk's about to go from 48 to 53 when you click somewhere else. And we're doing that because those, those, um, these hands, these blue hands here with of the heart combination is not accounted for. And there's one, two, three, four, five. So we put five over here just to make sure we have all of our hands accounted for. Um, these overcards, you can maybe also put into the junk. So put those in as well. The, um, the ace, ace, 10, ace, nine, ace, eight, you could also put those in. So this would go up to eight. And now you can see we're starting to get some draws, but really notice the easiest way to take hands from your premium made hand range is to put them into your marginal made hand range. So why don't we actually put Jack nine? Oops. We have to go back to these. Why don't we put Jack nine, Jack 10, queen, Jack and King Jack into our checking range. And notice now, we're starting to get closer to this nice balance of having a few more draws in our premium made hands. We actually put ace jack in this. And now you see we're starting to solve this problem of having too many um, too many premium made hands and not enough draws in our betting range. So what that does now is it makes our checking range a little bit too strong. Typically, you want about a 50-50 ratio on the marginal made hands to checks, but it's okay to have more than that More than that in terms of marginal made hands. Maybe what we actually want to do is we maybe want to go back and put in ace-queen suited into the into the um, range that we are betting with, and maybe we want to put ace-queen offsuit into the junk range. So we'll move this up to nine because we added an additional combination. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So now... This is starting to look pretty good to me. We have too many strong made hands in our checking range, but I think that's fine. Uh, and this is this is roughly what I would do in this spot. If I had to develop a range on this flop, starting with what we had before the flop. So 
Um, clearly, we can bet with our best hands, our over pairs and our sets, right? These are hands we can bet and be happy getting it in with. We're very happy checking these big cards. And notice, we're fine checking, I say the big cards, we're fine checking the um, top pairs, because if we check and our opponent bets, we're going to have easy decisions. I'll just show you how that's going to work out in just a second. And it may feel a little bit dirty checking hands like ace, jack in the spot. But if you really do want to strive to be balanced, this is a great spot to check with a lot of hands because many opponents will just attack you on these boards that are kind of marginal, right? I mean, this is a board that should be much better for the preflop caller than the preflop raiser if they're calling with all sorts of middle cards. So you're going to get attacked a decent amount of the time. Of course, this board is not nearly as scary for you as a board like 983 with two hearts or something like that, but it's okay. It's okay. The reason this board's actually fine for the preflop raisers is because we have all the queen jacks and king jacks in our range. If these hands did not exist, that would weaken these other ranges a decent amount. So let's actually assume now that we check. Notice if we bet and get raised, we're folding out all of our draws and we're only continuing with our premium made hands for the most part. Maybe you could justify applying a lot more pressure. Like if you're having a small re-raise range, maybe you small re-raise with these hands. 10-9, 9-8, -eight, and 10-8 -eight with a backdoor flush draw, maybe. And then, but you can fold out all of these hands. These are effectively junk hands. And again, notice these hands would normally fit into the junk range. But with the backdoor draws, I'm a sucker for backdoor draws. Okay, so let's assume that we check the flop and call if our opponent bets. So take a look at this range. Which hands are we check calling with? Well, it's all the marginal made hands. So let's remove all these. And this is what we are left with check calling the flops. Let's assume the turn is now a total blank two of hearts. Of course, it can get worse or better for you depending on what's going on. And now, whenever we check and our opponent bets, we're now only going to have two types of hands. We're going to have either a marginal made hand marginal made hand or we're going to have junk. So we plan to fold out some of our hands when our opponent bets the turn. A lot of people think, if I, well, if I call the flop, I have to call the turn. But that's not true. So take a look at which hands on these board on this board are particularly weak. Well, ace-king's particularly weak now. The under pairs are particularly weak. 7-6 is starting to get pretty weak. 8-7 and 9-7 are pretty weak as well. But notice here, whenever we check and our opponent bets... If he bets something like half pot, if he steals the pot more than a third of the time, he's going to immediately profit. And so we cannot really justify folding more than... We, we, have to, we need to stick around at least 66% of the time. So if we stick around with this range, as you see, we're sticking around 68% of the time, which is more than 66, so that's great. Let's assume instead that we did not have these jacks in our range. Take a look what happens now. Now we're only defending half of the time. And that's a problem, because now our opponent can just blindly bet, and he'll steal the pot more often than he um, more often than he needs to to show an immediate profit. And that's a problem. You know, if your opponent only needs to steal the pot a third of the time, but we see here he's going to steal it half of the time, that is a big problem. And that's why it's important to make sure you have some, marginal, some uh, decently strong hands in your checking range. So let's assume we check, our opponent bets, we fold out these hands that we have selected to fold, and now we go to the river. Let's say the river... For simplicity is another another blank. Now we need to go back and reassess the range. We check our opponent bets, which hands can we now fold? Well, we have a pretty easy spot where, depending on our opponent's bet, let's say we need to stick around a third of the time, we can just stick around with all of our top pairs, right? This is about two-thirds of the defending range, and that's going to be a really easy spot just to check call. Notice again what happens if we did not have these big jacks in our range. Well, now... Look what happens, right? If we Imagine we have no jacks in our range because we always continuation bet top pair. Well, look what we're left with. We're left with all hands worse than top pair. So now we have to call with something like this, right? We have to call with all of these pairs and that starts to get a little bit dicey. Check calling flop turn and river with these hands. And this kind of illustrates why it's, well, it does illustrate why it's important that you think about how you balance your range so that you don't find yourself in spots where you get to the river with a bunch of marginal junk. What a lot of amateur players do is they check call the flop with all their middle pairs. They check call the turn and then they find themselves on the river with all middle pairs and worse, obviously. And then they have to check fold almost the entire range. 
And that is a big, big problem. So what they need to do to fix this problem, again, is just make sure they have some jacks in their range. And, you know, I suggest actually having a lot in this scenario. And that's mainly just because we had a decent amount of premium hands to the point where we could justify taking some of the you know, otherwise premium hands out of that range and putting them into our junkie range. Um, let's assume instead we check the flop and let's actually put back in these hands that were in here. Something like this. Let's assume it goes, we check the flop, our opponent bets, we call. Let's say turn is a king of spades instead of a total blank, right? Now we have a kind of scary turn. Well, now let's reassign the hand. So now ace king is a good hand. All the jacks are good hands. And now these all drop to junk. So notice that, you know, this is probably a bit too many hands folding. So maybe we have to stick around with tens, nines, maybe something like this. And uh, this seems pretty nice. So now, even on a scary turn, notice we can still, we just adjust our range, right? We just adjust the proportion of hands we're sticking around with. And now we're left with a pretty strong range. Uh, going to the river, you would delete all these blue hands because they fold to a turn bet. We're left with this on the river. Well, left with these hands on the river. Let's assume now the river's, I don't know, blank this time. We check our opponent bets. Now we can still fold out the bottom part of our range. And maybe we are left with something like this. And, you know, we can easily call down with these middle pairs and top pairs and have a pretty pretty easy call. So as you can see, you can tinker around with this and just try to start thinking in this manner. Uh, again, a lot of people come to me and they ask, how do you play Jack-9 on this Jack-7-4 board? Well, it depends entirely on your entire range. It doesn't necessarily depend on how do you play Jack-9. It depends on what does your whole range look like. And then, also, how much is your opponent betting? Because, you know, all of this kind of assumed your opponent was betting about half pot. What if your opponent bet full pot? Or what if they bet two times the size of the pot? Or what if they bet one-tenth pot, right? If they bet one-tenth pot, you can't really fold anything. If they bet four times the size of the pot, where well, you should be folding a ton. And this really does illustrate what you need to do if you want to start really succeeding at poker. You have to think in terms of ranges and really analyze these spots away from the table. So uh, definitely try out the float the turn range analyzer. Play around with it. Anytime you post a hand on a poker form anywhere on the internet, you can come down here. I'll actually show you what you can do. You can do create image for download. Click that. And then you can right-click, save image as, and it'll save right to your desktop, and then you can post that image right online. Alternatively, if you want to save these ranges for later, you can click this button right here, save values for CVS, or to CVS, CSV file, can't read. And then you'll have this range in this sort of, um, it'll be in an Excel file. You can save this Excel file to your desktop, and then next time you come, you can click choose file, you choose that same file, select the file, then click upload ranges and it'll bring the range right back up again. So that will be very beneficial if you want to save ranges. Also, there are a few ways to make this a little bit quicker to use. You can click fill all pairs, you can click fill all Broadway hands, you can select desired ranges from you know, various programs, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So you can do that kind of thing too to make things a little bit quicker. Anyway, this is the float the turn range analyzer. I Hope you've enjoyed it. Hope it's um, hope it's been useful. I just realized that was sort of off the screen. My apologies. Whenever I made the image, it changed it a little bit. Um, here's how you just add in various ranges. Um, so anyway, that's it. I hope you enjoyed it. If you have any questions, definitely let us know. You can check this out at floatthetern.com under the tools tab. Again, it is the float the turn range analyzer. I hope you use it. Hope you enjoy it. And I hope you learn a lot from it. This has been Jonathan Little for floatthetern.com.